Welcome to Story Chats at Inspire Romance. I'm Elizabeth Madry, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Narelle Atkins. I'm Valerie Comer. Today we are talking about the CCR we've been reading recently just for fun. So um, this is rapidly becoming one of my favorite episodes to do because I get the best books for my TBR <laughs> from, <laughs> from YouTube. So I'm very excited to see what's coming next. So hopefully- Excellent. You all are also enjoying um, some recommendations, and um, we'll just we'll just dive in, just dive in. Who wants to go first? I didn't start the timer. Now I did. <laughs> Valerie, you can go first. Well, then I might have to put Tini down. Oh, I'll, I'll go first. Then. All right, no and I'll disappoint I'll disappoint you off the bat because I'm actually <laughs> going to talk about a book that we've talked about before, <laughs> just because that's a neural thing to do. That's okay. So the book, first book I'm going to talk about is Molly by Sarah Monson. So everyone has been raving about the yeah. Sewing in SoCal series. And I thought, well, I need to start reading these books. And I did really enjoy this story, although I did get stuck in nearly DNF it which Ooh. probably doesn't actually make any sense, but I will explain myself. So um, all these, I really, um, one of the things I really liked in this book was meeting all the other girls in the um, the, the sewing group. And right. I think that's, I'm looking forward to reading more books in the series because they're all really interesting, quirky women yes. as well. Very, yes. very interesting. And so Molly's in first person point of view. And as you know, I can be a bit funny with first person point of view. <laughs> And I think I've mentioned that before. And so the, the premise of the story is that Molly is on a mission to never tell a lie. She gets asked a direct question. She has to answer honestly. And later in the book, it, that, that gets unpacked a bit. So you sort of can understand what the emotional triggers are for why she's like that. But when we get to the start of the story, she's sitting And we in the say it like it's a bad thing to tell the truth, right? Right, right. It's, <laughs> it's terrible that she won't lie. <laughs> Yeah, but it depends on, again, it depends on context. Oh, so it where, um, yeah. It depends on context. So yes. the story opens with her in the, um, she's a Montessori preschool teacher mm -hmm. and she's sitting in the office and she's in trouble again because she's blatantly answered very bluntly um, a direct question from a very precocious preschooler. And so she keeps answering these questions and the, prince, and the principal's like, why can't you just redirect them and tell them to ask their parents? Yeah. And so she's sitting in this meeting and she's been reprimanded for this before and she gets fired. And then you've got the hero in the story who's been hauled out to the school because he's a residency, he's got a residency as a doctor with crazy hours and a horrible boss and he's having trouble in terms of childcare. He'll drop off Chloe, but he can't get back in time. And so he's listening to this person getting fired. He knows who Molly is because he, Chloe's talked about her. And so then he pursues her to become the nanny. So I loved all of the nanny side of it and it was hilarious. But I did get stuck with Molly on why she was prepared to lose her job because she adored and loved her job and she loved these kids. And maybe this is real life intruding because, I mean, I've obviously had kids that have gone through the preschool system and there's been preschool teachers who have just been amazing and usually the reason they'll leave is that they don't get paid enough mm. or they're not valued they can't afford to live and I just I don't know it took me it took me some time to get over the fact that she was prepared to throw away a job that she really enjoyed and was prepared to let these kids down because they obviously adored her and it's not easy to replace preschool teachers yeah. and if you've got special needs kids in the class or or whatever it can be quite traumatic to have a changing teacher <laughs> why she was prepared to to die on this hill. So it did take me some time to get past that. So if you get stuck like me and think, I don't know if I can keep <laughs> going because it's first person and I'm in her head and I'm like, I really don't understand and I'm so confused, please keep reading because it is yeah. really, really good. Don't get stuck on that and, and um, not finish the book would be my recommendation. I don't go. know what you guys thought of that. I mean, it might just be me. I think everyone, every reader takes their own little bit to the story and everyone has a different background and different thoughts. And as I said, that tripped me up a bit, but it may not trip anyone else up. I, I remember struggling slightly at the beginning because there were ways that she could have handled it that didn't involve lying that that would also not have because like you can especially with preschoolers you you can say you know that's not a question I'm comfortable answering you 
you need to talk to your parents or why don't exactly. you tell, you know, why don't you tell me what you think which it isn't is? Lying. Or, yeah. Which is not, neither of those are lies. They, I mean, maybe they're prevarication, but, not but, even. It's, not but even. yeah, not really. It's, it's yeah. not a lie. It's, it's not a fib. It's just, this is not my place to tell you the answer to that. So you need to talk to your mom. And then you, then when the mom or dad come, you say, Hey, by the way, they have questions that you should address with them that it was not my place to address. So I, I do remember thinking that, but I also like, I was able to get past it because for me, I'm like, well, we needed to set up the story, right? She needed to not be still a preschool because if she hadn't been fired, there would be no story because, you know, so I could, I could take it from the, okay, we needed we needed the setup to get there so I can roll with it enough um, to go there. I think for most of the time, a story has one give me yeah. that, that you just kind of have to go, okay, well, that's weird, but roll with it. But if there's like half a dozen give me's and you're like, I'm not giving anymore. Yeah. It, it, we're too far out in left field. But yeah, I, I'm usually prepared to give an author one kind of quirk with a book and um and it had better be important and it was it was yeah I can go like three or four honestly because I'm a pretty forgiving reader it used to drive um I used to do some pre-reading for a small press and I'd like tell the editor this is fantastic and then she'd read it and she's like how did you get past this 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 I'm like well but but past that these are she's like you're terrible at this job don't you can't do this anymore (laughs) you're terrible (laughs) because I'm I am a forgiving I'm a forgiving reader um so but yeah so Valerie you get one with me you're gonna get four or well, five I might but... get depends on how big the first one is right sure but fair. that's fair every yeah. story <laughs> is gonna have at least one yes. place where you're like eh, okay I'll, I'll go with it I'll go I'll with this it. one yeah we'll see. I'll, I'll allow it but I also like if it's a personal trigger like that's a personal trigger for you Norel because you had yeah. kids with preschools and that sort of thing so I get that like for me it tends to be like adoption if there are adoption issues or um like those for me are much harder to yeah. be the gimme um yeah. so that's like then maybe you get one because like okay if I'm going to swallow this nothing else better be big <laughs> And so you, you just told me what the trigger was, which yeah. I did not actually consciously work out, is that having had a special needs son, mm-hmm. if one of his teachers had have done that, I would have yelled. Just I would have been so yeah. cranky. I would have been, as a parent, absolutely furious because my son had so much trouble mm-hmm. integrating and it was just such it was just such a battle to actually do a whole lot of stuff because he's autistic yeah. and had massive anxiety issues. And he still lives with that today, even though he's a young adult. Um, so I think it's that parent trigger. It's like mm-hmm. I'm a mom of a special needs kid and this is like my worst nightmare. You're yeah. putting in front of my face and she's, yeah. So I think you're right. It's definitely a lot about what I'm taking to the store. Narelle would have been rolling in. You call her back and hire her back right now. <laughs> For sure. Or else she'd have been hiring her as That's a private right. private nanny. <laughs> oh, there. Yeah. But like we all, bring, yeah. we all bring our stuff. And it's good that you yeah. realize that it's worth, like, I'm glad, I'm glad you persevered because it is a cute, cute story. And the yes. whole series is super cute. And a good series. Yeah. 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 All right, Valerie, what do you got? I have got a Jennifer Rodewald story. Always you. So Lauren takes a job at a resort at Lake Tahoe. You're laughing. How come? Can is you hear my fire alarm? Oh, can now. Yeah, the, the boys burned their dinner, apparently. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> or it could just Sorry. be going off because there's bugs or something. I mean, that's what I assumed. You get <laughs> bugs in the fire alarm and sets it off. Yeah. But let's Sorry. Going. Anyway, <laughs> in Always You by Jennifer Rodewald, Lauren takes a job at a resort at Lake Tahoe to escape her father and her sister, whom she loves, but they're both in politics and she's an event planner and they just count on her all the time because she can work magic for them, even if it's like overnight. And they they just think that she exists to be at their beck and call and she's tired of it. So she up and takes a job most of the way across the country because I think she starts out in, I don't know, Maine or something, New Hampshire, somewhere up there. I still can't keep them apart. 
I didn't think to Over remember, <laughs> even though even though we did that episode. Anyways, um, she's airsick on the cross country flight, and she just barely manages to hold things together as she gets off the plane and she runs to the women's washroom and it's closed. So she's like, uh, men's and she runs in and there's a guy standing in front of her and she barfs all over him. So oh, this is, fun. this is a meat cute <laughs> for the ages. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's like chapter one. So I'm, that's not a, <laughs> that is not a spoiler. No. Um, Matt, believe it or not, takes that in stride. I, that's the give me in this story. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> he's like, really? Woman barfs all over you and you're like, and you're wearing a tux. And he's like, eh, didn't like this tux anyway. Um, he has- Is he a billionaire? He, is he a billionaire? Like, so he's got a whole stack of tuxes and it doesn't matter? No, no, actually he okay. throws it in the garbage. Um, he had left the upcoming wedding of his on again, off again girlfriend to his best friend. Ooh. He just couldn't handle it so he had decided to run okay and so he was in the bathroom he was going to change now he is now he has changed and because he just he can't go to the wedding he just can't do it he thought he could but he can't okay so sh there's a snowstorm and she's supposed to be going up to lake tahoe now the nearest airport to that is reno nevada and i have flown into this and i have driven to lake tahoe so uh, i'm like he, she never mentions what airport it is, but Lake Tahoe is mentioned by name and I know that it's the Reno airport. So mm -hmm. um, here is where I had a problem with the story. Oh, no. Sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> um, but to me, sense of place is really, really important. Yeah. And if you, you can't mess with it. You just can't mess with it. So I have been to Tahoe a couple of times and the idea, okay, there's a blizzard. So the highways are closed. Mm -hmm. So the idea that there are back roads that this guy could take in a Jeep to get from Reno Airport to Lake Tahoe when the highways are closed to me is like, there are no back roads like that. No. If, the high, if the interstate is closed, those back roads Everything are impossible. Oh, worse. Yeah. Yeah, they'd be closed. worse, wouldn't they? Yeah. They would be worse, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that was the give me that I had to allow her um, so in, in fact, sadly, the entire sense of place was missing. Mm. It's mentioned Lake Tahoe a couple of times, but it could take place at any resort. It didn't even need a lake. There was no, no scenes on Tahoe. Whenever they would go somewhere, it was like to a place a couple of hours north or a couple of hours. No place names. And that drove me crazy. Sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> However, I enjoyed the story. I, I really did. Uh, Matt has some serious issues with that ex-girlfriend who turns out that because he bolted the wedding, the wedding was called off and she's trying to get back with Matt and Matt's best friend who was supposed to get married that day is like livid with both of them. Everybody's angry at each other. So there's some serious baggage there and he's not actually ready to fall in love with Lauren like right this second, right? Yeah. So there, there are some big, big things going on in this story, and I enjoyed it. Um, they, the, the way that uh, Jennifer takes us through the process and stuff, um, I, I did really enjoy. And um, snowshoeing in the mountains and so forth is always something I love. So that part of sense of place, I mean, yes, in December at Tahoe, there is snow. So, I mean, that part, worked for me how they work through stuff um really it, it did work for me as a story once I got over the fact that my sense <laughs> of place was completely shot sure so I have a question so what if she hadn't have named it as Lake Tahoe and had have just said gone from the airport to a lake and it was fictional would that have fixed your problem no it might have partly because I wouldn't have had specific expectations mm -hmm. of that but to me, I guess sense of place is really, really important. So I get creating a fictional town. I've done it a few times myself, probably will again. Um, but it still needs to be anchored somewhere and be realistic to that place. So when you've got a place like Reno that's got the airport for Tahoe, then go ahead and name it. It's okay. 
like she landed in the Reno airport. Deal. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the town that's like two hours away and they go through this valley and, and the view is fantastic. And I'm like, where is it? I have been in that part of California. Where is it? I want to know which valley you're seeing. So if it's just all generic and could happen anywhere, like literally anywhere in the world, <laughs> no, that doesn't, it's maybe not as obvious to me, but it's still, I need, I need it. And this is my quirk, possibly. I may not share it with any of you, <laughs> but, um, but I, I really, and I've noticed that more and more as we've in the last few months done these um, location um, episodes where we pick a state and dig into it. I'm like, but this story could have taken place anywhere. Where's one that actually focuses on this area and helps me to get to know what it would be like to live there. Anyways, off my soapbox. <laughs> what was your first book? <laughs> so um, because they are romantic suspense, I am combining them. Um, and well, that I makes finished, sense. Yeah, I finished up the um, Janice Cantori series that I started for right. our firemen um, or not firemen. Maybe firemen. I don't know. I think fun, firemen. The fun I actually, episode. I, yeah. I think I downloaded them for firemen, but maybe because they're not actually, they're about a police officer. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> uh, burning, <laughs> burning proof and catching heat by Janice Cantori. They are police procedurals, which I have a deep abiding love of police procedurals and they are hard to find in Christian fiction. Um, so it is, I would call it romantic suspense, but really what it is, is a police procedural. The romance is there. So it, it qualifies because there's definitely romance going on. Good, because um, otherwise, I just have to kick you off the show. I know, I know, but I'm recording, so you can't. So <laughs> I feel safe. All right, um, the romance is there. It is a romance that spans all three books um, because the heroine is the police officer. She is engaged to someone else in book one. Um they break it off at the end of book one, but she's already kind of got the tinglies for the PI that she's working on. And so we're out working with, and he does for her. And so their, their romance lasts the whole three books. Um, but it was really well done. And I just enjoyed having a police procedural based romantic suspense, as opposed to running from terrorists. I get tired sometimes of, of having you know, Navy SEALs and running from terrorists um, because there are other suspenses out there. <laughs> um, and, and I do love, like I said, I really do love police procedurals um, and they are scarce in Christian fiction, which is sad because there are a lot of really solid Christians who are police officers. So like they deserve to have books. Fair so, anyway, if you have a love of police procedurals and romantic police procedurals, Janice Cantori has bumped up my list hugely. She was a police officer. So, uh, um, so that, that helps as well. She, they're very well-written, realistic, and enjoyable. Traditionally published, so they hurt the pocketbook a little bit, but still worth it. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. Norelle. Okay, well, my second one is Dial P for Perfect by Heidi Gray McGill. So I this is book 11 in a multi-author series. And guess what? This is the first book I've read in this multi-author <laughs> series. It's on because my list who, to read this one. Yeah, so who doesn't start at book 11? So, <laughs> I, And um, what actually is a few things that drew me to Multi-author series, I might. No. Yes. Because they're standalones, <laughs> right? Well, they're no. standalones, I'm sure. No? Okay, well, I would. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. All right. So this one is actually connected to an earlier one by Oops. the same author in the same series. But, I mean, it's, all, it's like, I mean, all romances do stand alone. It's very unusual to come across a romance that you can't just pick up and read. And, yeah, you may not under get all the nuances from what's happened in the past, but it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy it. So this one is first-person, single point of view, and we only actually have Ginger, She's the main character in the book. We only actually have her point of view throughout the whole story. So it has a romance arc, but it's in parts of the story, it sort of sort of hovers in the background. It's not front and centre. Okay. And it really is Ginger's journey and Ginger's story. 
but it has the romantic happily ever afters and what you would expect in a romance. So it qualifies from that perspective. But the reason I picked it up is that it's a body positive story. Hmm. So some, and sometimes you'll come across stories where you'll have the heroine who's just borderline neurotic about weight loss and dieting. And I just, that just drives me nuts to read. This is not what I want to read as a reader. And what I really liked about Ginger is that she was, she had a strong faith. There was a lot of Christian content um, in the book. And if you really like having a lot of faith content and a book that's more focused on that, then you'd love this one. And it really was her, it was, was her looking at um, how does God value me? How does God see me? Um, and she just had the most lovely sense of humor and could laugh at herself. And it's not labeled a rom-com, but honestly, I think it was funnier than a, a number of books I've read that are labeled rom-coms as well. Good so, job. Yeah. And a lot of that it was fun. fun. She could, yeah, she could laugh at herself. And so she get herself in these situations and, um, it was just, it was just such a joy to be in her head, if that makes sense. And as I said, it's first person point of view. So I'm fussy. <laughs> in terms of if I don't like being in your head I don't like being in your head but another big selling point on this book was the cat so there's a cat called Snickers and I just love the cat I mean I would read the book just for the cat and so we have Jenny one of our um, readers who comments in on YouTube if you know who Jenny is Mm -hmm. and I started reading this book and I messaged Jenny I said you have to read this book because of the cats Cool. you have to read it right, and then so, suddenly I get interrupted by someone in the family and I'm suddenly at 60 percent before I even know it I'm at 60 percent it just flew along is the and cat, is, a, is the cat sneakers like like tennis shoes or snickers like snickers, the, candy bar, the candy bar snickers like the candy bar okay but the cat is hilarious like the cat is really a character in this book in my opinion yeah so it was just um it was just a lovely story and as I said very bible based as well so if you're looking for something that has a bit of meat that's not just talking about an issue but actually looks at what the bible says about stuff then you'll really enjoy this one too and I love the the ending of it as well so it had the romance I said it has the romantic happily ever after even if you feel like when you're reading it that it could be a love triangle but it's not a love triangle and the romance, as I said, it's it, it's there, but it's not in your face, like most books. Okay. So it's a slightly different arc. Excellent. Valerie? My second book is called The Melody of Joy by Leah Busboom. This is the first time I had read a book by Leah Busboom. I would have remembered. <laughs> um, I enjoyed it for a few different reasons. Um, there is some from Canada, I would say it's got some cross-cultural stuff in it from the Latino um, population in Colorado. So Juanita is the heroine and she um, she has just, it took her a, a long time to get a job at this, the best place to work in her small town that has like the best paying jobs and the best um, uh, benefits and stuff. So she's just like clinging on to this job. And then she's suddenly let go with no warning. And it's basically because of a rumor that someone, one of her coworkers, co-workers started about her. So it's not even anything she did Oh, um, wrong. She had just led a meeting um, in chapter one or something, maybe chapter two, where the, the company is trying to cut back on expenses. So they're having debates about whether clicker pens are cheaper or, or <laughs> non-clicker pens are cheaper than clicker pens. Okay. So, but she never thought that it would be her job that would be one of the things that they would take away to balance the budget. <laughs> So she had just started getting to know this guy, Brendan, that she works with. He had been part of this clicker, non-clicker conversation, and they had both been amused together. So they didn't really know each other that well. But when uh, he's volunteering at their church's um, like soup kitchen, then he sees her come in a few weeks later with her little girl, and he's like, what on earth happened? Like, you know, she was my, I, I knew she was gone, but now she's like so destitute that she can't afford food like what's going on here right so he tries to talk to her and she's of course proud and doesn't want to talk to him and 
bit of time goes on and he decides to help her find a job and he does, um, which I found interesting that apparently it was as good a paying job with as good a benefit since she's working now in a um, restoration company for vintage cars. Hmm. And she's answering phones and setting up appointments and stuff. So um, she and Brendan also connects with her son, Matteo, who is three or four years old. And this kid is like car crazy, truck crazy. It's all he wants to talk about. So Brendan indulges this, this little boy with that. So Juanita is still in mourning for her son's father, um, whom she was not married to, who died in Afghanistan. Brendan is struggling with the fact that the woman he was preparing to propose to left him because she got a better job offer in San Francisco and didn't think that what they had was that serious anyways and why would he think he, she would give up anything to stay here with him <laughs> so they both have some some issues uh, to work through and um, so he's wondering if he's misreading Juanita as well because she's kind of hot and cold as well and he's like Mm -hmm. I don't know if I dare like try to get close to this person as well. So um, this is the first in a series called Paradise Springs and it's set in Colorado. In some ways it was kind of predictable, um, but that's not always a bad thing in a romance. So there was a lot of, of things I really enjoyed in the story as well. Cool, so. excellent. My second was To Win a Prince by Tony Shiloh. Um, and um, I liked it better than In Search of a Prince. I think it is, I liked In Search of a Prince quite a bit, but um, I was trying to remember In Search of a Prince, the first one is just in Bree's point of view. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Because most love triangle-y type books yeah. are. And it's so like your to, clue. Yeah. yeah, to win a prince is in both of their points of view. Yeah. And I really, really enjoyed getting to see, um, spoiler alert, Econ's point of view, um, especially given all that he goes through as, as his character arc in the story. If we hadn't had his POV, it would have been terrible. Um, <laughs> I yeah. just, well, he, it, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. It would he's the star of the book, absolutely. Because yes, Iris absolutely doesn't, is. yeah, Iris doesn't change, and her character, I mean, doesn't have the the, the depth and the length of um, development needed to actually get to where they need to go. Whereas Econ started a million miles behind the start line. Yeah, yeah. Iris is is very steady, and I like Iris yeah. a lot. But um, but it's Econ who really is the star of the book. He's he's fantastic, which is which is saying something when you take someone that you're sort of predisposed to dislike from how the first book ended and turn him into someone that you're really rooting for um, at the end. Uh, it's very, very well done. Um, enjoyed it a lot, a lot. That a lot, one's a lot. on my list. I haven't got to it yet. Yes. Bump it up. Yeah. And I think what I, what, I mean, talk, we've been talking about that sort of the give me sort of thing and the way that econ is unpacked, you get to the end and you think, wow, that was so well done. I didn't see it coming. And it just makes so much sense. There's no plausibility issues. It's no. all completely logical. And which is what I think makes a really good story is that you don't have any of those sort of gaps of, mm -hmm. um, am I, you don't sort of pause and think about stuff. You sort of just roll through it. Yes. Yeah, so it was a very, I think I would like, I'd say I'd probably be the same. The yeah. second one was probably um, better yeah. than the well, first the, one, but the first one wasn't bad. The, no, the first one was delightful, <laughs> yeah. but this one yeah. was just even better. So, um, yeah. which I love, I'm sad that it's only a duology because I love when series get better with each book. Um, but now the series is over because there's just two. Although, I think Tony said in the CRRG when she was in there a few weeks back that um, she might set d other books or another series on cool her island. Permission to. Yeah. I think the big give me with that series is that there is, in fact, an island off the coast of Africa sure. where there is a, a king and a queen ruling. I think that's that's the biggest give me for sure. that series so we've my, already swallowed it that's, in book one yeah 
I, I did that's not have even to. a give me for me I don't that I mean because I mean fiction has that fantasy element so I can go with the fantasy element in setting and stuff like that as long as we're not setting a small town in Antarctica you know what I mean like <laughs> yeah. as long as it's yeah. got some kind of plausibility but, but I wanted I'm happy to suspend to do that. I yeah, wanted to haven't. put one in the Antarctic desert <laughs> Valerie switching to writing science fiction said in yes. the future <laughs> of a very climate changed earth if yeah. we're the desert yeah. in Antarctica. Oh my goodness. I it's will say fiction. Uh, yeah. I had a little bit of a gimme on this one. The only tiny little piece was Matt, um, her friend who comes from the States to help with her company. And I did not understand how she was so blind when it came to him. Um, but it's a very small part that he plays and she does eventually figure it out. So it's, it's not like you could pull that whole thread out and the book would still be amazing. So I could give it, I could let go of it. But I, anytime he was on the page, I was like, mm, move on. <laughs> Okay, Whereas that didn't phase me, interestingly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I think, it's be, I think it's because, like, we, we read a book and we're in our head with our, with our backgrounds and our experiences. Whereas the character, um, a lot of people are blind to people's faults. We would have That's a lot true. less divorces in the world if people actually didn't have dopamine making them dopey when they fell in love I mean honestly I mean that's the truth I mean the romance people, author yeah yeah people are very good at um conning and convincing other people they're wonderful when really they're horrible and terrible and it takes time for um the cracks to show I mean your narcissist characters for example are, are classic examples of that yeah. they'll put on this yeah. beautiful polished charming front and it's not until down the track you realize that you're only seeing what they think you want to see rather than who they really are. So I can run with those types right. of things. I just assume those characters are potentially narcissists or, or whatever, or have agendas. <laughs> yeah. Fair, fair. It's a fantastic book. And if you haven't read it, you really need to, especially if you've read In Search of a Prince, I would say you could yeah. read it. Um, you could read To Win a Prince on its own. It would be fine. Um, but it's better if you've read the first one. Richer. I Richer, think, yeah. 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 Okay, fine. I'll bump it up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do it. Do it. Um, that pretty much reaches us to the end of our time. So hopefully nobody has, does, does, does anybody have a third? They just have to get in. No. No, nope. I'm nope. good. Okay. I think right. I'm good. All right. I only ever plan for two. We never get to a third in these yeah, episodes. That's so true. I just plan for two. <laughs> <laughs> that's smart. So let us know what you've been reading. You can leave us a comment on the YouTube channel or on our Facebook page, um, or you can comment on what we read and what you're going to read or have also read or any of those things. We love to see comments. And while you're over there on YouTube, don't forget to hit the notification bell and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we will look forward to seeing you again next week. In the meantime, don't forget to fall in love with a good book. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye, everyone.